everyone needs to take a seat. We're going to start the workshop action in this state as well. Uh, so welcome to Shards and Social Limassol. Uh, it's actually our first <laughs> series of events outside of some big conferences for the foundation. But today we want to talk with you well about sharding, about what are we doing, as well as uh, uh, in the a bit about their work. And uh, in general, we want to keep all of you have a nice time to network, to talk about so, well, and uh, that's in timeline. Uh, firstly, I'm going to tell you a bit about well, the charting through multi chain lens. Then, our uh, link of uh, integrations uh, kit is going to talk about the indexes of sharded system, some break. Uh, then, we have a multi chain state ST for optimism case study by Dmitry from Bitsbytes. And the end, wipes that will clean else. So, I'm going to start. Uh, yeah, my name is Ilya. I am head of architecture at Info Foundation. And uh, what first question is kind of what Info Foundation is actually building. Uh, we had quite a long journey. We started as a contract company. When in 2021, we moved to the K field, uh, did some projects in it. And in the previous year, we announced our main product, uh, Ultimate Goal, uh, ZK Sharding, called Neil, and uh, it's, it's sharded ZK Rollup for a few. Why? Uh, because at the moment, we see that current rollup solution just cannot actually handle some load which we predict to see in the future. You cannot actually scale your applications. You cannot accept that, well, one that your role can handle everything. You need some interoperable uh, system which actually can do this. And uh, first thing, yes, it's sharded ZK rollup. And let's define what is blockchain sharding. Basically, blockchain sharding is partitioning of well state as well as computations among different pieces called shards. In the way, so you can run calculations in computations parallel. And actually, if we look at the blockchain sharding from this definition, it's well, it's quite a general one. And it means that there are a lot of sharded systems which we didn't think about of them as this. Because, well, sharded state, last part of computations, uh, we know that list rollups are one of the examples of this. We have several separated states which are coordinated via Ethereum as a root layer. Um, we can say that ZK Sync Elastic Chain is an example of this. We can look at Cosmos and Polkadot as simple uh, system who build these things, as well as, well, more known as the sharded solution like Near, Don Multiverse, etc. And then we realized that we think, OK, how we can actually compare our solution to others. That was the issue for us. Because, well, if you build a product, you want somehow to say, we are better at this, or maybe we are worse in something. To do this, we try to decide, OK, we need some kind of classification, some kind of properties. We want some important things which we can compare between all of this system. If you want to run a, an application which will be going to compute something in parallel, which will have smart contracts which run parallel, well, you want to have this specification. So we came up with some, and uh, basically, at least for now, we defined four main properties here. First one is a chain creation, how chain can be created. It's cross shard messaging, basically how very close to interoperability definition, but well, a bit different. Uh, Interchain structure, basically how your chains are connected between each other. You have, if you have several, par several parallel chains, how they actually connected from the structure perspective, from the information perspective. And last one is fee model. Well, how do you pay for transactions? What are all these things? Shard creation, well, it's quite a simple one. It can be given permissionless or permissionless. Obvious one. 
in permission case, only the protocol that maybe developers can allow you to create a new shard or new chain. And uh, if you look at the example of this, we can think about near project, multiverse project, town project, as well as Jika shard. And permissionless, well, any user or developer can create a new shard, new chain in the system. Uh, basically, any rollup based stack is, well, can be considered as part of this uh, um, permissionless chain structure, a uh, shard creation, sorry, uh, group. And, uh, well, why shard creation is important here? Because actually, in case of permissionless uh, shard creation, you can provide more flexibility to users. In permissionless case, you have, we may have different tech stack, you may have different virtual machines underlying. With some cost, because obviously, in case of different uh, virtual machines, different tech stack, different these things, you have different security assumptions, which increase complexity of any interoperability, any cross-chart messaging between these chains. Basically, I cannot trust any person who just well, created someone you know. Second one is interchange structure. And uh, basically, the first thing which we need to acknowledge here is, well, any multi-chain system can be considered as decentralized acyclic graph. Duck. And uh, why? Because in all cases, if you want to send one message, one transaction from one chain to another, you have actually to, well, provide root of, uh, on the block, root state root, block hash from this chain to another chain. And in this case, you basically recreate these links from one chain to another. So, well, we create that. We create the centralized city graph between several chains. Then one block from one chain uh, may link to another block from another chain. Mm -hmm. And here is, first one is that with single source. It's the most strict one. Basically, you, all of your parallel shards, all of them are started from one source, from one genesis block. And usually then we talk about sharded blockchains, we talk about such type of structure. Because, well, near who proposed, I believe, one of the first proposals of this idea, uh, Tong and all the ancestors of Tong goes with this idea. And uh, the thing is, you start with one block, you can split into several chains, you can basically like usual fork, like, but the fork has feature. And then you merge them into one chain in case if, well, they are underloaded. Second type is dark with enforced updates. Now we have several separate chains. All of them has several separate genesis blocks. However, each end blocks, one, two, three, doesn't matter. Depends on the particular system. You have to send updates from one chain to another. Uh, it's more loosely the fucking system. And last one is, well, that we want enforced updates. Basically, you provide uh, information about chain only in case if you need to create a cross chart transactions or cross chain transaction. And uh, why it is actually, well, important here because depending on the how tightly are coupled uh, all these chains, you from this you can provide, or well, you cannot provide, in some cases, delivery guarantees for cross-chart transactions, uh, all relative stuff. Well, one, let's say, smaller subcategory here, but quite interesting to consider is address space. It can be not intercepted or full, basically, well, can you have two similar, well, basically identical addresses on two different chains, in case you do? can have them, it's full, other space, if not, well, it's not intersect the type of space. Uh, mostly, you can see full other space in all uh, the, let's say, roll-up based uh, stacks. You can see non-intersected other spaces in all plastic sharded blockchains stacks, 
Well, also you can see you non know, intersecting other space in the charging. Uh, next one is, uh, well, cross shot estrogen. This topic is actually quite difficult because any cross shot messaging mechanism is quite unique. So it's hard to define the good classification here, but we decided here to decide, okay, let's at least say there is three properties which are important related to this. First one is autolysis. Well, it's either atomic or non-atomic transactions. Uh, I believe mostly understand the difference, but I'll explain shortly. In atomic case, your cross shard transaction either is successful or failed on both source and destination shard. In case of non-atomic case, you can successfully update some state on one shard on the source shard, and the transaction will fail on another one, which creates additional difficulties for developers. The truth is actually in most of the system we see non-atomic transactions for one very simple reason. Non-atomic transactions are simpler, they are most more performant, and at the same time you can build atomic transactions on top of non-atomic ones. So that's why non-atomic are more frequent here. Second brand of validation mechanism. The difference is it's either optimistic or full verification. In optimistic case, well, one shard just believes that another shard is going to do everything well. In full verification, it doesn't. And in most of the modern systems, if you think about ZK-based rollups, networks, it means that they wait for ZK proofs to be defined. The react uh, consequence of this is, well, how fast those shard transactions can be processed. In case you are waiting for ZK proofs, of course, it's well, it's a more robust system. But at the same time, it means that you need to wait for CK proof. It can be 10 minutes in some systems, it can be an hour in some system. So it's the off here. And the third part, of course, that vestigial has permission, and well, again, basically permission, permissionless. And uh, this one, what's interesting, directly related, in, at least in all of the cases we've seen, to chain creation. Because in the case of chain creation, it's permissionless. It usually means that, well, a cross shard message to is permissionless, and as soon as shard is created, it can send messages to any other shard, and vice versa. Well, explanation quite obvious here. As I said previously, if anyone can create shard, I'm not going to, well, give an ability to this, well, someone who I don't know, or maybe just a random malicious folk to send any transactions to my system from theirs. And yes, last one is fee model. Uh, basically, it's either local or global one. Local model means that the shard conditions on the shard, the load of the shard changes the fee which users pay for this. Basically, if their particular shard has very big load at the moment, it means that, well, you're going to pay more for transaction with this shard than on another one. Well, in global one, quite simple, we have the same fee on the, all of the shards. And, uh, well, global system looks much simpler. For why it's actually, well, very straightforward user experience. As a user, and don't think about, well, what is going to be how much I'm actually going to pay, I definitely know how much I'm going to pay. The issue is, in this case, all load policy within the system depends purely on the some algorithmic way to do this. Which means, I believe in most of the current implementations, just, well, randomly split the shards into two new shards, that's all. Which kind of solves the problem, but not very really efficient at them. So this was kind of theory, basic explanation of the framework. Let's try to apply it to ZK Sharda as static kit. And well, ZK Sharda's architecture, at least on this feature, is quite simple. You have uh, execution shards. Execution shards process actual user transactions. You have main shard. It's synchronized. Execution shards between each other. 
In theory, you can reduplicate, but in this case, you spend actually more resources on synthetization. And because it doesn't process transactions, well, in CAD, in CAN, maintain lots of execution shards, thousands of execution shards, even more. So it doesn't create any bottlenecks here. But at the same time, the key sharding is layered to solution. And uh, to be layered to solution, and to kill a lot in particular, it should send the key proofs as well as data reliability to Ethereum side. However, it is solution which was created to be decentralized. And it creates some issues. In centralized rollup, it's quite straightforward. You run your node, you create your proofs, you send them to Ethereum, everyone's happy. In a decentralized solution, you cannot do this text so directly. Because, well, in decentralized solution, who is going to send proofs? Why are we sure that these people are actually going to send proofs and not just send around them or anything else? For this reason, we have a uh, Thing called synchronity. Basically, it's a centralized network responsible for, well, uh, maintaining all this process of proof generation. They send requests to the proof network, they get results, they send them to the Ethereum side, and so on. Generation in this case is uh, provisioned by the protocol because, and we decided on this with one particular feature in mind. In case of permissioned system, in case of permissioned uniform system, you are able to provide dynamic charts. You are able to scale system dynamically based on the load in the time. Next part is, well, it is dark with enforced updates. Uh, this enforced updates are uh, defined by the thing which is called sharp duck in our case. It's the algorithm which basically in very simplified way says that each block should uh, first of all link to the previous block in the chain, as usual, all blockchains. It should link to the block in the main shard. As well, it should link to the block of some neighborhood shards. Question messaging. I'm not going to explain the whole algorithm here. It will take some time, so I hope you will just believe me that it's just, it's first non-atomic, optimistic, but permissionless. And well, feed model, it's, it provides local feed model. Basically, each shard defines their fees based on the load. But of course, there is also base, let's say, it, base fee maybe not the best term here, but for some let's say base fee, which is related to things which the protocol is going to spend for maintaining the main shard, which I remind doesn't process user transactions, so it cannot get fees from them, as well as for maintaining all this L L2 stuff like proof generation, proof verification, data availability. And uh, Okay, and actually now we can say, okay, let's look at the key sharding, compare them to other systems. Here's a well, nice table. We have here base rollups. I know it's kind of more like a concept rather than actual project or actual product. But here I consider base rollups in classic Justin Dre defined uh, definition. And okay, now we actually can look at this. We can say, okay, uh, if you need a permissionless way to create uh, a shard, well, in, in these three uh, options, we have only one based on apps. It, it's very important for us. We cannot take either Polkadot or ZK sharding. If we need, uh, I don't know, non atomic and optimistic transactions, well, we have two options Polkadot and ZK sharding, actually, but we cannot do this based on apps. And that's what's interesting kind of for us to compare. But the next question is, okay, as a developer, why and should be interested in this classification at all? In this case, well, because you can define what options do you want. Here's a very simple example. Let's say I want to build on chain strategy gain with some NFT sales. I know at least two things about this game. It's first one, it's quite fast communication between users. I mean, 
I want to use or send their army to control the castle of another user that, well, don't wait for this. And second part, well, debug sales, it, it's going to be low at peaks. And in this case, I can sell, okay, for fast communication, I need non-atomic, optimistic, permissionless, cross-shaft communication, because, well, non-atomic and optimistic one actually gives you the ability to send cross-shaft transactions fast. I probably prefer version with permission of chain creation because, well, I want to kind of scale my application. I want to create different parts of this application, different contracts of this application in different shards. And I prefer it will be informed one. And usually we, the permission systems are usually informed one in the same tech stack. And Probably I'd prefer, maybe not as the main requirements, but I'd prefer to have global fee market. Why? Because, well, it's a game. And I do not want my users to think that, oh, how much I'm going to pay for my next stack? Now, I just want very simple fee model so any user can really easily predict how much are they going to pay. And uh, it was about framework reduction, but one last thing which I want to share is, well, it's not just properties and they're not atomic between each other, they create combinations. Because you can say, if I have some two or three properties, which means I can build on top of these properties some interesting features. In our case, it's, well, first one, it's with permission to chain creation, on atomic optimistic permissionless, because sharp messaging, we have application scaling. What do I mean here? Usually, when we talk about scaling the cap, we talk about, well, blockchain scaling in general. The thing is, as a particular application developer, I don't care much about, well, blockchain scaling for other people. I, I want to scale for me. And I want to be, act to be sure that, okay, if it's going to be a lot of peaks, I want that this part of my system will continue work stable, which means I can split either state or have, or have duplications of the state of my applications on different shards. And, well, that basically means if some token sales go on, on shard A, everything is going to be work nice in shard B if my application, in case if I have some logic of it on shard B. And to work here, first one is, well, if that with enforced updates and local fin market model, we may have market-driven load balancing. That's not some features which we are implementing at the moment, but that's the thing which we are researching at the moment. Maybe we should do this. What do I mean by market-driven load balancing? Well, the idea is, if we have non-intersected other space, and you have uh, all uh, structure there, the yeah, there on each shard, well, fee, a diff, fees are different. That means that, well, at some point of time, as an opener of application, I may like to say, okay, I just want to move my application, the whole contract, from one shard to another one. Even more, in case you can add, you, uh, you can give user the trigger for this, in case you can give user the ability to program this, to say, okay, if Last 100 blocks, the capacity of the block was 19%, and because of this, the fee was so high. I want you to move my application from this to any other shard. And that's really nice because instead of uh, some simple and maybe not the most efficient block algorithms on load balancing, which I mentioned before, we have pure market-driven load balancing, the user defines if this load on the shard is well fine for them or not. And the last thing is, previous one I said that, well, we are not implementing it yet on the research of this. This one is kind of, we just think about this. Uh, because if you have that within first of days, non-optimistic, uh, non-atomic optimistic permission list or shard messaging, Previously, I said that we have, well, application scan. And here I add ZKPs, zero knowledge proofs. The truth is it may be any security mechanism, which 
is applicable to your system. It may be TEs, it may be very smart consensus protocol, it may be anything. In our case, it's finality is the key piece. And uh, in this case, measure. You may build actually trusted, trustless parallel computations. What do I mean here? First one, if we increase the number of transactions, at the same time, we will optimize which machine. We definitely know in the future we will optimize our execution environment even more. I mean, not we as new foundation, but we as community in general, blockchain community in general. At the same time, and here's one important remark, when people think about blockchain charting, they usually think that, okay, if you have 100 validators and 100 shards, then to have 1,000 of shards, you need 1,000 of validators. That's just not true. Actually, you need the same 100 validators. That doesn't change the centralization at all. You have the same network, the same centralization, the same validators, which are just we go to AWS and click, give me one more machine, please, or give me 10 more machines. In this case, that means that you create, can create lots of shards if you have quite robust security mechanisms. Then, well, you can run lots of computation parallel. You can provide people access to trustless computing, not only for simple cases as now, but for scientific reasons, for medical reasons, or anything else. And as I said, that's definitely distant future, but this is, it is the distant future, well, we as New Foundation want to achieve the charging technology. And uh, I believe that's all from my side. Uh, thanks everyone.